So we might uh, begin. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, to all of you for joining us today. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Mihi and then uh, the acknowledgement to country before we meet the panel. Tuia ki te rangi, tuia ki te whenua, tuia ki te nākau o nga tangata, ko te mēnui, ko te aroha, ti hei mauri ora. Uh, tēnā koutou e te whānau, tēnā koutou aku rangatera, ki ora e ho mā, tēnā koutou i a tātou tini mate haere, 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 te honga mate ki te honga mate, te honga ora ki te honga ora. Ki a tātou i tau nei, te aura, uh, ka mihi ki ngā iwi kainga, ki te kingi Māori, rirei, rirei hau, pai Māori rei, Ka nui te aroha i tō koutou māia ki te pautoku i nga kaupapa e tika ana, te korero o te katoa. We work together for the well-being of everyone. Nō reira e homa te nga koutou, te nga koutou, te nga koutou katoa. Uh, warm Pacific greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, te nga koutou katoa, ku wai au, uh, who am I? Uh, ko Kim Tairi aho, no Waikato aho, enari e tipu aki au uh, e otiputi, uh, ki te noho au ki oai rāka e nai nei, uh, kua fitu tau e noho ana au uh, i Tamaki Makaurau, he kai toha poka aho ki te wānanga arunui o Tamaki Makaurau. Hello everyone, um, I'm Kim Tairi. My ancestors are from the Waikato, but I grew up in Dunedin. I live in Auckland now, and I've been here for about seven years. I am the university librarian at Auckland University of Technology and chair of Open Access Australasia Executive. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you are living and working, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and continuing, and their enduring connection to place, culture, and story. I extend my respect to Indigenous colleagues joining us today. We also want to acknowledge the mamai, the pain, the sorrow, the hurt that the voice referendum has caused. Excuse me. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, Many of us here today, Tautoko, support the call for a treaty. Always was, always will be. Today's kaupapa, or purpose, is uh, in two parts. Part one, we'll be chatting with the first panel about Indigenous-led journals and publishing avenues for Indigenous research. And part two, we'll be hearing more about Indigenous knowledge protocols and uh, the sharing of knowledges in ways that help to ensure that they are treated respectfully in the public domain. A little bit of housekeeping to kick off. Uh, we have Slido, and you can uh, put your questions uh, into Slido, and the link has uh, just gone into Slido now. Uh, and uh, so throughout the session, if something uh, pops into your mind that you want to ask any of the panellists, please put it into Slido. Uh, I just want to remind you that you can tweet if you're still on X, um, but you can also skeet, toot, and add a thread um, about the session using the hashtags uh, OA Week or hashtag Open Access underscore ANZ. Unfortunately, Professor Catherine Chamberlain, Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, and Dr. Kirsten Thorpe are unable to join us today. Uh, but we have a fantastic two hours ahead um, and wonderful uh, panelists uh, who will be sharing their uh, knowledge and uh, experience uh, in creating the space for Indigenous uh, and Pacific research. So I'd like to start with introducing the panel uh, from the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education. We have Dr. Caitlin Barney. Uh, Caitlin is a senior lecturer in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies uh, unit at the University of Queensland. 
Her research focuses on improving pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students into higher education and advancing understanding about the role of collaborative research and music making between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous people. Caitlin is also the managing editor of the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education, No Mai, and welcome Caitlin. From uh, Aotearoa, we have two other panelists joining us from uh, the My Journal, Dr. Vinny Olson Rida, uh, Na Potiki, uh, Tama Pohori, Nati Pukinga, uh, Nai Te Rangi, Te Aroa, is the co editor of the My Journal alongside Associate Professor Te Kalwe Ho Hoskins, the Pro Vice Chancellor Māori at the University of Auckland. And Vinnie is currently working as a language planner for Statistics New Zealand. He was a senior lecturer uh, at Victoria University of Wellington in Pōniki, specialising in uh, socio linguistics of Te Reo Māori revival. He is a published historical fiction and fiction author, poet, songwriter, and translator, No Mai Vini. Welcome. And then finally, uh, we have Shelley Hawani. Uh, Shelley is the mother of 13 and a mama to her many mokopuna of Waikato and Nati Makino descent. She has been a kaimahi of Te Wanganga or Aotearoa for two decades, leading and serving in a variety of ako, aro, and rangaho spaces. Shelley holds the belief that if we don't tell our own stories, others will continue to tell them for us, which is why she continually looks for ways to support kaimahi and toera in the sharing of their untold stories. No my Shelley. I feel like I've been talking for absolutely ages <laughs> in that introduction. Um, I just want to also say if you uh, want to place your own acknowledgement to country uh, into the chat, please do so. Um, we welcome that. It'd be lovely to know where you're standing uh, today. So um, we'll get straight to the questions. We have about uh, 50 minutes together, which will be absolutely fabulous. And the first question to the panel, and we might start with Caitlin, is what led to the development of your journal? Thanks, Kim. So um, I'm the managing editor of the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education, which I've been doing for the last 15 years. Um, and I work closely with the two co-editors, uh, Professor Martin Nakata and Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, who are both Deputy Vice Chancellors Indigenous. So the journal actually started 50 years ago. This year we celebrated uh, 50 years of publication. So it started in 1973 and it was then called the Aboriginal Child at School. So it's had a really long history uh, and it was originally uh, funded by the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and then later funded by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit at the University of Queensland where I'm based. And it was originally published at two month intervals but then in 1996, it got transformed into the Australian Journal of Indigenous Education. And since then, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit, where I'm based, has he heavily uh, funded and subsidised the journal. And then in 2003, when it was 30 years of the journal, it was relaunched as a peer-reviewed uh, research journal. And then last year, it began as an open access scholarly journal. So it has a really long history and a big archive. So that dialogue that's ha happened in the journal over the last 50 years very much maps out that history of um, Indigenous e education in Australia. Um, fantastic. Um, Finney, would you like to tell us a bit about the genesis of the My Journal? Yeah, kia ora, Kim. Tēnā koe, and thanks for such a lovely introduction. And tēnā kōrua, Caitlin, Shelley. Um, yeah, so the my the my journal has a rather young history, I think, in comparison to um, to Caitlin's, in that we've been running as um, as a journal since two thousand and six. Originally, as the my review, um, the my review was published until twenty eleven, and then we've been the my journal since then. Um, we've been open access um, from the conception of the my journal. Um, so it's, all, it's always been an open access um, gig for us. Uh, we have a, a complementing international Indigenous journal alternative. So we kind of work side by side um, with the, the two journals. Um, and we are 
predominantly, I think, we share a really strong relationship um, with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, which is a centre of research excellence operating out of Auckland, uh, uni uh, Auckland University. And they have, um, well, Ngā Pai has a mission um, which is to grow and enhance uh, Māori researchers and Māori-led research that build together the foundations for flourishing Māori futures. So that's something that we hold as really dear to us um, as kind of like an ethos for our journal. Yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora, kia ora. Um, Shelley, in your mahi, have you had anything to do with um, Indigenous journals or publications um, for Indigenous researchers by Indigenous researchers? Oh, kia ora, Kim. Um, we've had a, similar to the My Journal, we first published our first Wānanga journal in 2007, and we'd never done that before. So we'll, we'll be 40 years old in 2025, so we're still a relatively new institution, an uh, Indigenous institution here in Aotearoa. Um, but that was the beginning for us, was in 2007, and then we published yearly after that, and that journal was open to all of our staff any staff member could write because we took the view that everybody has something to say mm. and that kaupapa can transcend any discipline, any space. So um, my role in there started first as a writer. My very first time I ever published was in 2007. Uh, and it was about being disillusioned with Mātauranga Māori and where I, where I could fit into that world of, of Māoridom. Um, but since then, that journal ran for eight years. And then we opened another journal and we had Wahi and Ngangaru, which was about breaking through the waves. So the first one was about laying those seeds. The second one was about breaking through those waves and, and getting more interaction. And now we're preparing to move into the online open access journal. So we've been on a journey of growth and my role in that space has been to write, to mentor, to publish, to sit there with somebody and hold their hand and get them through those last few words so they can get to publishing stage, um, but also to contribute my own writings in different spaces as well. Good point, uh, good point. Um, so the next question is um, about challenges. So did you chase, uh, sorry, face any challenges when developing and maintaining the journal? Um, you know, getting getting people to peer review can always be tricky. Um, you know, getting people to get things in um, and follow th kind of the, the process, I guess. Um, so I'll just open it to um, the panel. And, um, yeah, that would be great to hear about some of that. And if you've got any tips for overcoming some of those challenges, I think our audience would be really thrilled to hear about that too. Can I say something, Kim? Yes, go for it. <laughs> um, I think, well, it's an ongoing challenge, yes, for us around peer getting peer reviewers. That's it. That is, I think, an increasing challenge. Um, even since COVID, um, everyone's so busy, and I don't have any answers to that. Um, our main other challenge is funding of the journal. So um, the Indigenous Engagement Division at the University of Queensland is currently funding the journal. Uh, and so we have at times tried to look for philanthropic support or whether other schools and faculties within the university would like to contribute to that. And so that's an ongoing challenge. But uh, also recently, Informant have contributed financially to support the journal. So we're really thankful to them as well. So yeah, probably financial um, the funding of the journal is a challenge for us. It's good when... Um... Publishers can come to the party and they they recognise the value of open access and they also support it in different ways by doing things like informing, um, funding journals where they can. It's uh, mm -hmm. nice to see that. Um, Vinny or Shelley, do you have anything to add about the challenges that the journals face? Um, I, I can go if you want. Um, I uh, have been the co-editor of my for about probably a year and a half. So um, in terms of the, the long-standing um, 
you know, the, the length of the journal's life, I probably couldn't say um, in terms of, you know, finance and things like that, because I've been very lucky to have my little portion of time when, when my has been, um, you know, sorted in those kind of like background type things. One of the things that I thought it's really funny, Kim, that you mentioned peer review is because I didn't realize that this was something that every journal experiences. I had made a note um, of, you know, this question that uh, we find it, um, we find it, and it's not a, it's not a challenge as such. It's we have a group of um, such keen peer reviewers that are really open to being approached, and I think we worry about overworking them or asking too much of them. Um, so we've tried uh, in the last little while, especially since COVID, where our submission rates have grown um, uh, quite a bit, and um, we're sort of finding that our current staff levels are like, oh, there's heaps of work on. Um, and uh, yeah, so we don't want, I think that's a, just a real thing, key thing that we're always aware of, aware of. We don't want to ask our really keen and eager people to be doing so very much. Um, we have a, a group of amazing peer reviewers who um, sometimes lead, you know, peer review, sometimes in support. We try and kind of like split the labour a little bit so that they're not always the, the lead peer reviewer or, you know, things like that. Um, but, yeah, we're just really cogn cognizant of that at the moment as our submission rates are a bit higher. We're all volunteers um, apart from a couple of part-time staff, so um, our ability to get things done is, um, you know, a little bit slower for that fact. So, yeah, we're just really aware of that at the moment. I'm not sure if anybody else is feeling mm. that. <laughs> I just wanted to say, because we haven't yet started our online journal, mm -hmm. um, for us it's breaking down those those barriers of of putting our writing and our stories out into that, that cyberspace and mm -hmm. sharing them for the world, because what happens to our knowledge and our matauranga once yeah. it gets put out there, how do we safeguard that, how do we ensure that uh, hurutanga, that protection? So that's about um, having to shift mindsets mm -hmm. and, and break down some of those those barriers. Another area for us is being a fledgling institution, the infrastructure that's needed to be able to support this. Um, we've tried a couple of times to set up OJS and just never got there. Mm. But this time round, um, I really want to thank, and I think Don, Donna Coventry's in the audience too, I really want to thank Donna from Tufera, from AUT, because I reached out to anybody and I saw that they had a lot of channels on their website. And I said, we need help. Can, is there anything you can offer us? And... They just opened up their, their doors to us and said, come and talk with us, come and have a cordial and we'll be able to, to mentor you in that process. So from that regards, while we haven't yet established anything, just getting it off the ground has been huge for us. And we're hoping by 2024 we'll finally have that in place. Yeah, I think that's one of the things about the open science, open research, open access community is that it's about utu or reciprocity so if you're giving to the community you give back to the community when you can and then that balance is maintained so that the um the uh mana is enhanced of all the indigenous journals that are in this space and um you know it's just the beauty that sometimes the people will appear when the kopapa needs it um, so, um, and, you know, I work at AUT and um, I didn't, I didn't say anything to Shelley about that. Honestly, I didn't plant that. It was um, completely off the cuff. So uh, um, Tika and Kapai to um, our scholarly communications team for uh, um, supporting uh, um, Shelley and others in their, um, their work. Fantastic. So the next question is, um, how important is community? And however you define community um, from your, you know, your your perspective or where you stand within the research ecosystem, and what can Indigenous-led journals do to support this? And we might throw to Vinny first. That's such a massive question, and I have been thinking about this um, question for the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to try and not talk too much about it. I think community um, for for my and for myself, I think it has a, a several sides. There's our readership, the people we really want to engage with our journal. There's our authors, 
um, and the people the people who are writing for us. And then there's the community of research. Well, there's the community and the research ethics that I think that our readership and our authors um, are willing to accept uh, when they read a, a piece of published work and how they think about um, research integrity. And um, and then there's our people in the back end who are doing our peer reviewers and, and how we look after them and treat them as a community of people who are uh, offering their time up for us. And I think um, over the last, particularly since COVID, um, with our growing number of submissions, we've been trying to kind of rethink how we uh, consider our readership and our authors and our peer reviewers and who the right people are um, to be um, contributing in those, those different ways. I think we want to be a really strong home for Māori, Pacific and Indigenous um, writers and scholarship. Um, I think that's, you know, that's still our, our goal, that's still there, but the way that we're thinking about that, I think, has become um, a, a bit more uh, intense in a really good way. We're trying hard to think about, actually, who are the people we want to be um, reviewing, i.e., you know, critiquing scholarly thought and thinking about that so that they can offer up um, their, you know, their research integrity for card or their philosophies to our authors for consideration prior to publishing and part of that has been thinking about things we don't know ourselves um, as as editors and how do we make sure that we're doing our you know back-end work um, sometimes it probably looks like the normal day-to-day -day stuff when you're when you're finding peer reviewers it's just that for us we're now thinking a bit wider um, than our, our traditional um, scholarship I think um, anyway I, I'm almost speaking for myself here um, and so, you know, we're also, I think, going through a bit of a period of change um, in this, this society where for Māori academics and scholarship, we've been really lucky, or well, my generation anyway, has been really lucky to benefit from a long line of kaupapa Māori um, scholars who have been working and establishing these spaces for their careers, and I'm following them, and we're starting to think, you know, okay, we've got this beautiful work from them, how can we you know, bring that out into the fold for, for other communities of people as well. So, yeah, lots of great, amazing change that's affecting how we're thinking about community at the moment. Uh, Caitlin, you do have anything to add in this space? Uh, yeah, I really liked what Vinny was saying there about community and the many different communities that are, are part of the journal. And I think that's, for us as well, the great thing about going open access is um, the readership that it can you know, mean that, you know, we've been really excited that how many views there have been of the archive and it's not just the current volumes but the back archives and um, some of that the historical work that's happened in the journal that, um, that that meaning of open access means that it's much more accessible to um, Indigenous communities who might not, you know, have access through library catalogues. So, um, yeah, we've been excited to see that, you know, there's been over 100,000 views of article abstracts even in that 12 months since we've gone open access. So I think that's the exciting thing about the diverse communities that can open up to with open access. Thank you. Um, Shelley, in thinking about community and and for us, we think about hapu and iwi, um, that nexus between academic research or what Wananga are doing and the public in our community. How do how do we get things back back to the Fenua, back to the uh Hokainga? Have you have you had any th thoughts about that with the um genesis of your journal? What we're finding is that many of our, our contributors, our writers, um are master practitioners. Mm. So they're the carvers, they're the weavers, they're the artists. They're the um, people who have been working in the social work industry for years. And what we're trying to do now is they're, they're the link. They're the link to actually getting to the people. So if they're already doing work in the community, it's not about us going in over top of them and then trying to make ourselves settled in there. It's actually that they're the, that honunga and they're that seen face, that kanohi kitia. And it's through them that we're making those connections back to iwi and hapu. Yeah. So we're not having to go out and find people. They're actually coming in of their own accord. Um, no mihi for that. Um, I might just throw to a question from the um, audience. 
Uh, and it kind of relates to some of the earlier uh, Fukado ideas that you've already touched on. And this question's from uh, Leilani, um, and it's to the whole panel. How do you manage cultural load or the emotional labour um, and to those subject to academic workload models um, and have management, particularly for if you're sitting inside a university or a research unit or a wānanga um, supported you by allocating reasonable hours to do this mahi. And, and Vinny, you touched on how the fact that, you know, your editorial board and your peer reviewers are volunteers. I mean, how how do academics um, manage this, this, uh, this mahi on top of other things? Um. It's such a, a, a um, an important question. So kia ora, kia ora Leilani, and, and thanks, Kim. Um, I think in this this climate, there's um, it's such a massive time for universities. Um, and I'm also just um, before I give you any any fakaro, I just want to also um, remind that I'm not currently working in a in a university, and there's a little bit of a privilege in in, in that. So um, you know just. Um, because I'm lucky to be in a, in a different workscape. So um, there's, there, there's that as well. So I know that there's those things going on and I don't want to um, say something that's, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, yeah, we do ask a lot of, of our um, of staff who are working on journals and academic spaces because they tend to be over and above. Um, and one of the beautiful things that I will just say I've experienced as a co-editor um, is the way that the team operates is that we um, really understand other people's workloads, so we don't um, we don't put pressure on people to, you know, respond or um, or complete anything by a certain time frame um, within within you know reason. And I think that really helps us to be able to have our open access journal to publish things um, that we are maybe a bit fluid with timelines. So. We might go live with a publication in a different manner than we used to um, prior to you know COVID and things like that when workloads were different and it just allows us to be a little bit more fluid and I think that fluidity has meant something to us as a, as a team and I hope it's meant something to our, um, our people as well. Um, in terms of our reviewers we are constantly, um, we have a, a limit of how much we contact them now so we've sort of, um, yeah, said that we'll ask them to do a certain number of them and then we kind of give them a little break um, and we don't ask them. We've grown our pool of peer reviewers, so we've really tried hard to do that. So we've got more people to talk to um, and ask. So we're spreading the load a bit more. It's little things like that that I think are, are really important. On the emotional load, we um, call each other a lot and talk about um, things if we if we need to, to make sure that nobody's going through it alone. But um, as a final thing, I just want to acknowledge that Maya is really lucky to have Ngā Pai Te Maramatanga support. And we have these beautiful, esteemed academics um, of, of Māori Dham who work in Ngā Pai, um, who are always there and they're always willing to tautoko and support as well. So we're super lucky to have that beautiful network of seasoned Kaupapa Māori academics who are there for us. Um, yeah, I hope that's an answer, Leila. Mm. Yeah, um, Caitlin or Shelley, do you have anything to add um, on this this Kaupapa, this Patai, this question? Yeah, okay, if I say something, Shelley? Um, yeah, I agree with everything Vinny was saying. I think we also try and be really careful about how often we're asking peer reviewers and as well try and have quite a large um, pool of people we can draw on. And that's one thing that we've liked about OJS, the Open Journal Systems platform, is that you can see how many times you've asked someone to review and how often you've asked them as well. And we'd be very careful about, um, yeah, too much load on people and because uh, we all know as academics are constantly being asked to, to peer review and have to be really careful about workload. So that's something we like about OJS. Oh, Pai, thank you. <clears throat> I just wanted to add, um, we've done peer review in our, in our journal space up until this point. Um, but what we're considering as we move forward into the online space is we're actually wanting to establish a, a collaborative journal between the three wānanga and so by doing that, we would be the host, but by doing, by collaborating with the other wānanga, it, it broadens the pool of, of 
um, mātauranga that we can draw on, and so we're not just limited to our own small space. Um, another thing that I've noticed is that we've had contributors to the My Journal who have put forward a name for a peer reviewer and offered up, in, and in that case, I've been offered up as a peer reviewer. So even then, that authors can also offer up names to add to that, that kitty as well. Bye, can't buy. Um, so this is, because um, it's Open Access Week, we do have to talk about open access. Uh, so it would be good to know um, from, from each of you why you've chosen open. I mean, there'll be mostly librarians here, so it's no surprise um, that we are very supportive of open and um, bibliodiversity, lots of different routes to open as well. So it'd be interesting to hear from your perspective as people that are um, leading, um, supporting uh, Indigenous-led journals, why open for you? And um, this time we might start with Shelley, if that's okay. I think the key word there is, is access for us, yeah. for us in our wānanga. Looking at the community that we serve and the tauira and the staff that we have, um, if there's anything behind a paywall, it's very hard to access at all. And a lot of our um, scholars, our, our Māori authors, do write, do publish behind the paywalls, and we can't afford subscriptions. So that's one key thing, is about making sure that that um, mātauranga is accessible to everybody. And that's been a huge reason about why we want to go there. But also, we're also wanting to uh, widen that that um, that kupinga, that net of contributors to an international level. Mm -hmm. And open access also allows will allow us to do that in a very um, structured, purposeful, but meaningful way as well, that we can maintain our own uh, mana in that space. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have really enjoyed about looking at the open access spaces, that we don't have to compromise who we are as a wānanga. We can take go in exactly where we are and then engage from that platform. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Caitlin? So yeah, we went open access last year and um, that happened because from 2012 to 2021, Cambridge University were publishing the journal and then in 2021 they said they could no longer publish the journal and we had to look at different options to be able to continue the journal and it has this very long history and we wanted it to keep going. So we had discussions with the UQ Library um, scholarly publishing staff and we also spoke with other editors of journals both journals that are published by large publishers like Taylor and Francis but also open access journals published through universities like QUT that has many open access journals and then we made that decision to go open access so we're really thankful to library staff particularly at UQ and QUT because they gave us a lot of advice on that transition to open access and also in relation to copyright because we have this large archive that we're in the process of getting onto the new website so yeah it's definitely meant that it's more an accessible format and um, yeah we've been really pleased with it being open access since mid last year and then we also um got accepted into the directory of open access journals, which was great as well. Fantastic. Bini. I told Toko um, both uh, both Caitlin and Shelley and what they said, it's it's very much the same thing for us. We want our own um, people to be able to access um, the things that we are thinking and publishing um, in a really quick and easy way. We don't want them having to um, enter necessarily a university to be able to find those things um, or, or enter a space that's paid for subscriptions with access to readership. We just want them to be able to see it so that they can see all that's about them and for them and written with them in mind. And I think the second part um, that I'll just tack on the end is I think for us there's also a part of us wanting to be findable um, so that um, media journalists when they're doing stories or when anybody's doing a story about us um, they can actually start contacting us um, mm. and asking us as authors of our own stories um, for our own voices because that's something that's I mean it's still so very um, missing in, um, in the public debate our, ourselves but at least being open access we are locatable we just rely on people to, um, to, to have a look um, so I think that's another big part of it for us as well as being there for others to find us. Um, thank you very much for that. 
uh, when when do you believe needs what do you believe needs to change to ensure Indigenous scholarship is part of the dialogue when addressing some of the big issues facing society? And I'm going to throw this straight back to you, Vinny. I could talk about this all day, so I'm going to try to be really brief. It's related to my last answer, and for me, it's all about platforming and public debate spaces. Um, if we, have, I think that if we you know, look, um, have sort of a really short look at what's out there in the, in, in the scope of public debate on big issues. Um, the primary voices of, you know, carrying those popular thought, they're not necessarily Indigenous when it comes to Indigenous issues. They're also not trained um, necessarily. They might be academics and scholars, but they may not even be um, trained in our areas of research expertise. So there seems to be a bit of a mismatch, I think, sometimes between the expert that's being, um, you know, consulted and, and presented um, within the public debate and their background. Um, and I think um, that's one thing that I, I would love for us to be able to change if I had a magic wand. It's that our, um, you know, fourth estate or whatever you want to call them, are going looking for the right person before they start presenting the thought. Um, I think that's a really big one. And then the second one is kind of um, a, a different track of thought. As language accommodation, I think we've worked really hard at my journal, and I know other journals in New Zealand have too, to be able to adequately accommodate Indigenous languages. Um, I've has, you know, we still have experiences with other journals where we're asked to do um, things that I think are kind of outdated and archaic forms of othering when it comes to language. And I think for our Indigenous languages, we can absolutely change that um, as part of our scope. So those are the two things. Who are we platforming in public? And you know, are we allowing our languages um, accommodation in space? Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's about that being making sure that it is actually mana enhancing for the researchers and the community and and the people, um, and the right people are speaking. It's like there's some tikana tikana around that. It's not just, um, it's not always the people you expect. Uh, in that have the voice, it, yeah, fantastic. Um, anyone else, Shelley? Do you have anything to add? I suppose it's it's like going into a mainstream conference, and then because you're an indigenous presenter, you end up in the last slot on the last day mm. because they sort of don't know where to put you. And 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 then they then when they're talking about what you're doing, we're talking about narratives and pūraku and pūkōrero, and they're talking about myths. Mm. So that disconnect definitely that that Vinny spoke of is a big part of that. But also I think it's just about, um, you know, there's a language that's in Tuaro Aotearoa and we have our own way of languaging. And even when we step out, some people can't, can't resonate with that languaging. So when our kaimahi take their writings to other spaces, they're mm. being told to change their languaging, their English language, because that's not a kupu or that doesn't fit in with this particular kaupapa. And that's why Open Access for us is that it's about actually honouring our ways of knowing, doing and being and honouring our language and honouring the ways in which we articulate that. Um, Caitlin. And the only other thing I was going to add was, so for AJIE, I know uh, Martin and Bronwyn, the editors and the editorial board are very much focused on moving the discussions towards educational success and self-determination, you know, in Australia and internationally. And I think that's the great thing that having the journal open access can lead to that further dialogue and discussion. And I know authors who published then in the journal have been invited to, you know, speak into media or uh, write for the conversation or other platforms like that. So I think it does help with that, um, perhaps media being able to find someone who they, who's the appropriate person to speak to and to shift that dialogue into more success models and things like that. So um, open access is definitely raising the visibility of Indigenous voices and Indigenous research. That's, that's so good to hear. Um, the next question is, what methods have you used to disseminate knowledge to your communities? So um, in Aotearoa, we often talk about the kumara vine, but the kumara vine is about um, networking, whakafunangitanga. It's about, uh, it's very relational. 
uh, in our spaces. So it'd be good to hear um, uh, what you've done. And so we might start with um, Caitlin this time. Well, at the moment, our journal is still, I guess, very a traditional print, um, not print, but now online and people writing just articles. But we have been talking about, you know, shifting to having um, video abstracts and things like that. And I know a number of journals do do that who are open access and thinking about are there other ways of including audio or um, story within um, articles. So we are talking about that, but none of those things have kind of shifted at this point. At, at the moment, it's very much just, um, you know, articles. Thank you. Um, Shelley, uh, what kinds of ways are you reaching out to community? I would say from a Wānanga context, we get what, what a lot of people would, would call NTOs, so non-traditional outputs. And that's because those outputs aren't in the written academic form. They're, they're in artworks, they're in sculptures, they're in our funny tupuna. Our stories are written on the walls, you know. So those for us are um, some of the key things that we have to be mindful of when we're putting out our quarter because we don't want to be uh, leaving out a portion of our community because it doesn't fit into the, 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 the space that's been created. So that means we've got to amend that space to be more encompassing, to be more embracing. So there's that, and the, and the idea of waiata and sound of Waikorero and Karanga, there's so many beautiful ways that you can articulate and tell our stories. And so that's what we would be looking for in the open access space, is how the open access space allows us to do that. Mm, Multi-format, sounds awesome. Um, Finney, do you have anything to add? Um, no, we're, we're having much the same conversations at the moment about trying to grow um, the way that we allow people to disseminate through my, um, but at the moment we're still very much the, the traditional print. The one thing I will say that, um, that I, I love most of all um, is we, we recently did a, a special issue from Professor, the now Professor um, Anne-Marie Jackson, and, um, and that special issue was a really massive learning curve for me. It was the first one I'd seen as a co-editor. And what I noticed is once uh, once you have a special issue editor working on a special issue with their students, their areas of expertise, their colleagues, their scholars, the dissemination of that happens in such a really beautiful, organic way, much like the Kumura vine, but you've got this really amazing organic presence um, mm. carrying from person to person to person, right from student to public to whānau to community um, and right into the academic circles. And I, that was a massive learning curve about how powerful um, that can be, which is not credit for myself to take, that's credit for Professor Anne Marie Jackson. It's really beautiful. Um, it's it's really interesting in the social media space now because since um, X has uh, there's been a um, mass mass leaving from X uh, in in recent months. That how do you find your communities again when people are trying to learn new platforms of social media and what works best? And they all have their own ways of um, searching and using tags. And so it's really interesting. Um, you know, I have been looking for Māori Twitter on different platforms or Indigenous Twitter on, on different spaces. And slowly, you know, you can see the community coming back, but it's where you're going to invest that time because you want to be where your networks are. And that's that was always the beauty of social media in the past. It was about being parts of communities of practice. So it's it's really interesting to see that there isn't one way to do this, but we need to open up to kind of being multimodal and looking at non-traditional approaches to disseminating information, even in the open space, which is not traditional itself. Fantastic. So uh, the next question is about um, what is needed to ensure Indigenous scholarly publishing reaches the communities it wishes to serve? And um, it, it, I think it's kind of a um, building on to the question that we've just had. And we might start with you again, Shelley. Oh, 
of the word whakawhanaungatanga comes to mind. And it's about the relationship building. And I think that for us, with an Indigenous publishing space, we can't estimate the power of whakawhanaungatanga. Because in those relationships, people will speak to you, but they'll also speak of you. Mm. And they'll be the ones that send out the karanga. They'll be the ones that put the pānui out. And they'll be um, the ones exactly the way that I was able to come to this space was someone talked to someone who sent me an invitation. It was not something that I went out looking for. So that's the beauty of whakawhanaungatanga. And I think that's something that we really want to hold on to within our wānanga space about open access. Again, how do we hold on to those values that are us as Māori and those tikanga, those ways of practising, ways of knowing, doing and being, so that we're honouring the communities and honouring the, the, the koha that they're sharing with us. And that's what those writings are. Each one of those is a koha. It's a contribution of consequence to our, our bodies of knowledge, to our own ways of learning, to um, our communities of practice. And so that would be one of our key, I would hope, fundamentals when we were in this space. Fantastic. Does anyone else have something that they want to add? Um, we might just, we've got, we'll ask one more question from the pre-prepared questions and then we'll slide over and ask a question or two from the uh, audience. And um, so we might finish up with the prepared questions on how do we strike a balance between making research open and accessible while ensuring we adhere to the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty? And I just wanted to touch on that before we kind of leave uh, these questions. So, Vinny, we might start with you. Yeah, I was having a bit of a, a bit of a think about this, and I'm not sure I'm going to word this the right way, but I'll, I'll give it a go. I think um, by sort of us leaving a little bit of space to be able to be adaptable as we learn about our communities and the way our communities feel about data sovereignty. I think, um, in my experience, the Māori community have been problematised for our feelings around data sovereignty, but when you dig deeper, you just see that actually the, the, the data sovereignty, um, well, the data systems that were built were just built without any kind of thought in mind, and when we've gone back and critiqued those, we've been painted as the problem, but actually the problem was the jump at the start. So um, I, I kind of see that um, that as, you know, leaving a bit of space for us as well, while I'm learning about other Indigenous communities that I, you know, feel like I can be around for and learning how um, those communities feel about data sovereignty and the same for Māori as we evolve our own thinking around it. Mm. And the second part is there's a lot about open access that I think appeals to ind Indigenous communities as well. Um, I have I've had scholars who absolutely won't do anything anonymous. They will absolutely want to be named on everything, mm -hmm. and that doesn't always match up with our, our, our um, feels around data sovereignty too. And it's so just keeping being aware that we've all got learning and evolving and growing to do. So leaving space for that when we make decisions around our systems, I think, is really important. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, Shelley or Caitlin, do you have anything to add? I've had one thing, and that is just simply from our perspective in the Wānanga, it's about, um, in regards to that data sovereignty, where does that data sit when it goes into that open access space and does it go onto somebody else's server and someone else hosting that? And so that's been one of our key things and really grateful again from um, to Fira because the option for us to create our own servers, to host it ourselves, and we already have our tikanga in place, we already have our, our ways of doing it in practice in place, so we can just stay in that space and we know that it will be tikanga and puno for us. So that's a starting point for us. Caitlin, anything to add? Uh, no, I think it's ongoing discussions we're having as well with our um, editorial board, who are all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars on our editorial board and the editors that um, we're thinking about those issues around data sovereignty and what does it mean in this transition to open access. And we've also been, you know, talking with um, copyright people within the library in terms of our very large archive that, you know, goes back to the 70s. And I think, yeah, it's an ongoing discussion and there's um, different perspectives on it as well. 
Now, Mihi, thank you very much. And we'll just go over and I think we've got time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. So this one is for you, Caitlin. Um, you mentioned funding from an institution. Was it uh, a challenge securing funding from, um, uh, you did mention a specific publisher. Um, how did you sell the value of the journal uh, and as opposed to the cost? Well, um, it, we haven't had to sell it in terms of, I guess, just since the 80s, 70s or 80s, the, the journal has been published by and funded by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit. So it's just been an ongoing commitment from the unit that I've been in that has um, been happy to publish it. But um, it is a commitment that, I mean, in some ways we would like other parts of the university to be willing to support it. And we've tried to make that case to other schools about how important it is as an Indigenous led journal. Um, and it's the only journal in Australia that focuses on Indigenous education. But sadly, at this point, we haven't had any further funding from other places within the university, but it is a commitment from the unit where I'm based to continue um, funding it. And um, we didn't ask Informant. They actually contacted us and said they would like to contribute um, to supporting the journal as well, which was really great. So we're, we're grateful for that. But, um, yeah, at the, at the moment, the uh, unit where I'm in is happy to keep funding it. But I guess it's if, if they weren't, it would become an issue in terms of going forward. Mm, can't pie. So we might finish up with a question um, around... Um, what can the wider open access, open science, open research community do, uh, especially in the ANZ region, to support your kaupapa, your mahi, your journals, the work that you're doing? And um, we'll start with Vinny. I think just helping us celebrate our scholarship is a really big, um, a really big thing that we can all support each other on. Um, you know, we have um, such a wealth of amazing um, Māori and Indigenous scholars here um, and I think just showcasing that work um, wherever we can is such a, an important um, thing. It's not just about citing and um, those kinds of things but sharing and um, disseminating and all of those kinds of things that help get our our work out there and get our work to be um, seen, you know, adding our papers to databases of interest or, you know, whatever we can do on those things are really tangible, amazing things that um, uh, that I know lots of you will be doing already, but um, but every every little bit helps, I think. Um, and I really love when, you know, I work in a different space now and I have people saying, hey, I stumbled across this paper that I got given from this person who works for this. And it's actually, it's really, um, it feels really rewarding, I think, when those little moments happen. It's a great connection. Right. Um, Shelley or Caitlin? Any last words? Well, I think that, that networking, again, that fucker for your tongue up, but that networking in regards to, um, you know, we're now going to be writing and publishing in the space, and there are many other Māori doing that. So when I travel to another institution and I meet the author of an article that I read from my journal, there's a little bit of a um, heady there, there's a little bit of excitement there because these are our own people. And we not only get to read their work, but we get to then talk to them. What was your thinking behind that work? Where did this come from? How did you go about it? So that's probably an extension of the open access as in the platform to write on. And I saw that um, being added to a community there. It's about those community relationships and building on those too. I think that'll be quite important for us anyway. Yeah, I agree. Just the sharing of what's happening with the journal is great. And whether that's on X, <laughs> Twitter or whatever comes <laughs> next or in other social media platforms and or LinkedIn, I found is, is also something useful. But just sharing the important work that scholars are publishing in the journal, I think is really great. Well, I'd like uh, everyone to join me in thanking our fabulous panel, Vinnie, Shelley and Caitlin, who my te paki could use the reactions. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for uh, your time, um, your whakaro, sharing your experience of uh, working for, working with, being part of Indigenous-led journals. Um, 
of course, it's something that we're really keen to see more of and grow more in this space. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you uh, today. Um, so uh, thank you very much. You're quite welcome to stay, but I can understand if you don't, haven't got the time to stay around for the next hour. Um, we're going to have a five minute stretch break. Um, turn off your cameras, go and get uh, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and we'll uh, come back for the second part of the session. Um, Matiwa, see you soon.
Kia ora everybody. We'll just give you, um, everyone a, a minute to come back into the room after their comfort break. Kia ora koutou everyone, um, for those of you who uh, are joining us just for the second part, uh, kuwai au ko kim tairi tōku ingoa he kai toha puka ahu ki te wānana aranui o Tamaki Makaurau. I'm Kim Tairi, I'm the University Librarian at uh, Auckland University of Technology and I'm also the Chair of Open Access Australasia Executive uh, Group. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the second part of the session. Now, um, if you're here for the first part of the session, uh, this part is a little bit different. So what we're going to do is give each of our uh, panellists uh, five minutes to talk about uh, how uh, their work um, enables uh, the sharing of knowledge in a way that aligns with uh, their community rules and protocols and um, how it can contribute to Indigenous knowledges being treated respectfully when it's out in the uh, public domain. Just a reminder that if you have any questions uh, for our panellists, um, pop them into Slido and uh, we will get to them um, towards the end of the session. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you uh, to our uh, panel and uh, then uh, we'll hand over the uh, share the screen um, and time uh, for their presentation their five minutes so our first uh, panelist is uh, Dr Rose Barrowcliffe um, and uh, she is the Bachula postdoctoral uh, Research Fellow in the Department of Indigenous Studies at Macquarie University in Sydney. She's a member of the Global Centre for Indigenous Futures, the Indigenous Archives Collective, and the 2023-24 uh, uh, Enrich Global Co-Chair. Rose also works as the First Nations Archives Advisor to the Queensland State Archives. Her work and research is based on her own experience of trying to access archival records about her country and examines embedding Indigenous rights into uh, archival practice. No mai and welcome, Rose. Then we have uh, Dr. Aaron Winton. Uh, Wilton, sorry, Aaron, <laughs> um, who is a research leader at Manaki Whenua, uh, Landcare Research. Aaron leads a, a research program on uh, biodiversity informatics, particularly associated with the national significant connections for which Manaki Whenua is custodian. Aaron has a long term interest in increasing awareness, access, and use of biodiversity data. In recent years, Aaron has engaged with local contexts to help with development, application, and testing of biocultural labels in the context of natural history collections. And then we have Teputu Raya, um, who is the program manager for the Pacific Virtual Museum Project at the National Library of uh, New Zealand. Teputu is uh, from the beautiful islands of Moki uh, and uh, Palmerston uh, in the Cook Islands. Uh, Taputu specialises in working with Māori and Pacific communities and giving them opportunities to share their stories and their own narrative. We also have uh, apologies from uh, Dr Kirsten Thorpe, who I mentioned at the beginning of the session from the Indigenous Archives Collective, 
who couldn't join us today, but we're really fortunate that Rose is also part of that collective, so she will touch on uh, some of the work that they've undertaken. So uh, we are going to start with uh, Rose. So uh, welcome, Rose. Thank you, Kim. Can you hear me okay? All right. So um, I just want to say that I probably, my presentation that I prepared would, if I did it all, would run a little bit over. So I might just, um, I can put a few slides up on the screen or I can just speak to it, whichever people would prefer. Um, it, it's if you want to share the screen, that's fine, Rose. It's, it's okay. up to you. Yeah. Let me see what I can. What I can manage here. Now, can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So, of course, let me start quickly by acknowledging. Um, that all Indigenous people today in the lands you're coming from and recognise yourselves and your, your communities as the original and enduring knowledge holders for the country that you're from. Um, and really what the two components that I'm, I've, I'm speaking about today um, are about tools for appropriate access is what I like to call it. Um, and I think often we, uh, when we think about open access, it's often this binary that something's fully open or fully closed or restricted. Um, and I am both an academic and my research is on archives. So I, I, I kind of, I get to see the full continuum of knowledge and how it's managed. Um, and what myself and particularly my Indigenous archives, collective colleagues who are very similar in that regard, a lot of us are uh, both in academia and in collecting spaces, um, we think about you know how do we how do we interrupt this um, this cycle of dispossession of knowledge from Indigenous peoples, and how do we how do we support Indigenous people actively being involved in the use of our knowledge? So the thing um, I guess I want to be clear about is when I, I I tend to use the terms data, records, information, and knowledge somewhat interchangeably, um, and I. But when I'm thinking about data and records, I'm really talking about the container that holds the knowledge. So that could be an academic journal article, it could be an audio or visual recording, um, something like that. And a lot of the legal rights about management of knowledge are based around the container. The knowledge within that those containers that I'm concerned with particularly is Indigenous knowledge. So when I say knowledge, I'm always talking about Indigenous knowledge in, in these cases. Um, so the first, the first component of what I'm talking about is um, traditional knowledge labels, which most people have heard them referred to as that, but they're produced by local context. Um, and so if you have seen them, you'll know that um, the, there's some of the icons on the screen here for some of the provenance labels. Um, so the, the traditional knowledge labels were developed to connect um, Indigenous knowledge being held in records back to the community they came from. So when we're thinking about knowledge management, we're always thinking there's three key questions we always need to ask ourselves. The first is whose knowledge is it? And in that case, we're thinking about, want to think about the provenance. Um, and then how can that knowledge be used or should that knowledge be used? So what protocols do we need to think about? And then what can that knowledge be used for? Um, and there we're really thinking about permissions. So uh, the local context crew came up with labels for each of those different um, questions. So the first one um, developed was around provenance um, and that enables record keeping institutions originally um, to, to put in labels that can be customized by community to attribute knowledge and records back to a tribe or a, a clan or even down to a family le level. Um, and that can even, I just want to flag that that can even have multiple different Indigenous communities attached to one record or one knowledge container as well. 
So then they branched out a bit more and then developed the protocol labels and the permission labels. So these are all available on the local context website, which I think the link is going to be dropped into the chat for everyone to go and explore a bit more on their own time. Um, and it has the breakdown in there about what each of those are meant for. I guess the thing for, for I know there's a lot of librarians in the audience today, and I guess the thing to clarify, uh, and if there's one thing you take away from this today, is that traditional knowledge labels and then the biocultural labels, which are the same thing, but they only they relate specifically to biocultural data and information. Those labels are owned by Indigenous communities. They are developed by the community, they are controlled by the community, and the community gets to decide if, when, and how they are applied. Not libraries, are not the glam sector, collecting institutions, not universities, and not researchers. That is not who they are for. So that is, I think that's the biggest misconception I see about the traditional knowledge label. So if that's the only thing you remember from what I say today, please let that be it. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into developing the labels. A lot of people just see those icons and they think, great, I'll just go co copy that graphic and I'm going to stick it in my repository and that's that's all I have to do. But in fact, um, there's a, a lot of work in the background that needs to happen before, and I know my co-panellists will probably speak to this, um, about conversations within the community. Um, there's a lot of often governance issues that go along with that. There's sometimes software development that needs to happen. There's agreements and MOUs between the community and the institution before you get that very simplistic label to be applied. There's a lot of background work that needs to happen. So where does that leave institutions and librarians who really wanna do the right thing and really want to um, be using Indigenous knowledge respectfully, particularly in an open access situation. Um, well, that's what the traditional knowledge notices are for, or the traditional knowledge, um, sorry, the biocultural notices. So those, there's only three of those. I'm just going to quickly flash some examples on the screen here. Um, and these can't be altered they just simply are a disclosure notice to say, we know we can we have some information here that requires um, further investigation and it belongs to Indigenous communities in some way, shape or form. So there's a biocultural notice. This one um, is an attribution incomplete notice to say, we know we need to understand this better. Um, and possibly this one, I think, um, I might have got that the right one. Well, those two are the wrong way around. But anyway, the other one is open to collaborate. And really that's for researchers and institutions to put it out there to say, we want to work with Indigenous communities and knowledge holders to improve this, the management of it, the, the attribution of it. So that's that's traditional knowledge labels and local context in a very, very quick nutshell. <laughs> Kim, do you want me to speak about the Indigenous referencing now or do you want, me, do you want to come back to me? Um, I'm happy for you to just carry on, um, okay. Rose. Yep. Okay. So switching to the other tool um, is the Indigenous um, Knowledges Referencing Guide that uh, the Indigenous Archives Collective, we, we produced this earlier this year for Caval, which is like the Council of uh, Victorian University Libraries, um, commissioned this work. And really what they wanted to do it was for us to produce a style guide. Um, so I'll just quickly recognise my co-authors of this. Um, um, and when we started talking about the style guide, um, we, like anything, you pull a string and it just unravels all these other things you have to think about. Um, and we realised that... Um, there's, there's layers of autonomy when you're thinking about what knowledge is to use and citation and that sort of thing. So um, within the scope of what we were commissioned to do for this piece of work, we really needed to stipulate that it's only um, its intended audience is undergraduates and liaison librarians, really. It's not, it can be used obviously for HDRs and research stuff, but there's a whole other um, amount of work that needs to be uh, done in that looking at peer review, looking at ethics boards, 
um, and all sorts of stuff. So when we simplified it down to that, our clear goals were that we wanted to um, provide a toolkit for undergraduates to uh, learn how to critically analyse sources, recognise and respect Indigenous knowledge authority, support the reclamation of Indigenous knowledges. We wanted uh, students to understand their own positionality in relation to that knowledge. And we talk a lot about in the guide, what is the relationship between the author and the knowledge? And you want that gap to be as small as possible for the, for the I guess, the authenticity or the validity of that, that publication. Um, and then once they've thought about all that, they should be able to confidently draw on and attribute Indigenous knowledges. Um, so what we did is we just uh, developed a decision tree. Um, and again, I know the link is going to be shared for this. So if you want to see that in detail, you can go to the website and read through that decision tree. Um, so basically it got through, uh, is this an appropriate source? Is this the best possible source you could be using if you want to talk about Indigenous knowledges? Um, and then we finally got to the actual style guide, which is what we were originally wishing to do. So it's very, the style guide we came up with is very, very similar to a normal style, style guide that any university would have. But um, uh, you can see highlighted in orange there that we've added in where possible the cultural affiliation of the author. And I know in the previous panel, there was a bit of a discussion around that about who are we platforming and whose who's knowledge are we raising up? And, and if we're going open access and we're just letting it all out there, how do we know what's what's good, what's bad, who it's coming from, I guess. Um, so we really wanted to, if someone has self-identified, we wanted to support that and make it clear that their cultural authority comes through in their academic work as well. We'll give me some tips on that. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it there and um, give my co-panelists a chance to talk. Uh, Namahi Nui, thanks very much for that, Rose. Um, please, if you have any questions for Rose, um, pop them into uh, Slido and uh, when we've heard from the other two panellists, we'll come back to the questions. So next up, we have um, Aaron from Manaki Whenua. Um, so over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Kim. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, a real shift potentially uh, from previous talks and from a library focus, I guess, and the, the, this is around a biological collection, natural history collection, um, and that's my background. And I should also say that very strongly that I come from that collection background, um, but I've been very fortunate to be working with a very good um, Maori manager from... Uh, uh, Nati Maru up in Taranaki, who has kind of been working alongside me with this Holden High Hire. And it's been, you know, working with him and the likes of Maui Hudson that has been re really good. And um, so I really do want to acknowledge those those people. I do have a little bit of a, um, a presentation um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background around some of the bits and pieces. So this is really a use case and the application and around the biocultural labels. Um, I got in interested in this area because I was a director of a collection and had a long-term interest around the data access and appropriate kind of management and, and use of that information. Um, and so I'd engaged quite early on around the conventional biological diversity and, and the Nagoya protocol in, um, in, in particular, you know, which is around equitable sharing of outcomes um, and use of material for sustainable and futures and of, of humanity and environment. Um, and through that, I actually met um, Maui and got involved at a very early stage in the working group developing the biocultural labels. Um, so I was very fortunate to be kind of in the ground level of some of that work. Um, and what was able, we were able to do through that is, is participate in the development from a collection perspective, and then move into actually trialing those labels with uh, four different iwi um, to see how they go, what's the practical implications. And I'm just going to briefly outline some of that stuff today. Um, so just because it's a change of topic, I just wanted to give you a feel for the type of things we're dealing with. So I'm talking primarily about biocultural labels. And as Rose said earlier um, in, her, in her talk, um, this is around genetic material. 
but we shouldn't actually think of it just being these physical objects. It's actually the derivatives of those, um, so, uh, plus all the data that goes with them. Uh, so inevitably, these collections are collected in time and place. So there's a very strong um, connection back to the whenua, back to the rohi from where they've been obtained. So Manaki Whenua holds five so-called nationally significant collections. There's a big um, arthro in invertebrate collection up in Tamaki. Um, about, there's about 1.5 million collection objects, but it represents about 7.5 million specimens. Um, plant collection uh, down in Rikona in Lincoln, um, where I was the director of about 800,000 collection objects. There's a culture collection, diseases on plants, held on liquid nitrogen, about 20,000, the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and this has been one where we've actually had really active engagement with indigenous communities around development of um, food or potential for food coming off these collections. Um, and also the use of collaborative stuff around Mataranga Māori in terms of controlling for disease and things as well. So there's also the fungal collection. So this is a dried collection of fungi, uh, about just over 100,000 records in that. Uh, and then there's the weaving collection of cultural um, harakiki um, clones uh, that have been put together and, and are maintained in collaboration with different, uh, the, the weaving, the national weaving group. So this is, the, this is the material that we were considering in these collections, a large amount of material um, and this is a partial map of some of the records with the emphasis to kind of show that it's not just New Zealand based material. So as we entered this, we were very conscious that it wasn't just a New Zealand or a national responsibility that we had, but it was actually in a global perspective that we had the responsibility because we hold material from around the world. And like a library, some of our material is actually lent um, and or borrowed from overseas as well. So there's that understanding that we actually need to be cognizant of of those relationships and those interests from anywhere in the world, any of these indigenous communities that we, we may engage with. Um, like libraries, um, you might may or may not be so surprised to know that we actually have quite a lot of new material coming in every year, you know, 10,000 um, items in one, one collection. Um, but on top of that, there's this cascade of data updates as we, our knowledge is improving. So it creates some challenges when you start to apply labels or start to discuss the projects with communities because you, that understanding around what the collection is, what it holds is a part of that knowledge that we need to open up and share with them and, and gain that, so they gain that understanding of what we hold and how it's worked to date um, and, you know, how, what, what these influences and what the issues might be. Um, so we had this project, uh, I'm going to dive into the details a little bit now, and um, what we realised is that there were, from a collection perspective, to meet the requirements with the communities, there were different types of projects that we needed to recognise. So we were specifically here testing the biocultural labels, remember, um, and we and we work, working with these communities realised that we needed um, multiple types to connect our collection objects to um, types of project. And these were are very strongly about being a non-hierarchical one. And I'm just gonna show two here. One of the things we wanted to do was to actually have a whole collection. So every object in the collection, we wanted tagged with, with the local context notices. You know, we're open to collaboration. Um, we acknowledge that there's interest, um, cultural interest in this material. And we wanted that to be ubiquitous. And so we basically, what we've done for each of those five collections I showed before, we've created a local context project and attached those notices to it. And this is where one of the really interesting things to follow on from Rose, um, Rose's comment about remembering that labels are for the indigenous communities is really important. So one of the learnings that I did, despite having been through all of this, was when we got to these was like, oh, so when someone put the label on, the notice will disappear. And it's so obvious when you think about it now, but going through the process and working, I never had that realization that, you know, and you can, and, and, and what we did was work with the local context people to say, hey, at this level, 
it would be really good if those notices could hang around to show our intent um, that we actually are open to collaboration from other groups. Um, because what we did with the communities in particular was what we're calling area of interest or um, territorial interest or however you want to, to, to name those and say, okay, we've in, we're actually engaging with these communities. And that's the second part that I would say is really, really critical throughout this process. We didn't create these projects without having sat down and talked with that community, agreed on the wording with that community, and, uh, and um, Holden in particular spent time walking through the data and showing them the data and, and, and things with that community. So answering all the questions they may have around it and its provenance and how it's got there and what that might mean going forward. Um, and so that's a really strong, important thing. And I think one of the beautiful, one of the great things I think about these local context um, work is it actually provides a focus for sharing that information and for taking that first kind of step, if you like, um, and, and, and doing that because we have so much information that's kind of hidden and locked away. And this provided us a positive way to actually start those communications and, and talking that dialogue with those communities. Um, so this was the main way we worked, uh, main project we got with. And as I said, this is this is Rose's tip of the, or the piece underneath the iceberg, right? So what you see at the end is these little labels. Um, and you can see some of them in the bottom. There's a screenshot of one of our projects that's up in local context. Uh, but there's the work that goes in between it, both from the community developing whatever labels you want, but in terms of also that understanding and that dialogue that happens um, as part of the process. So we shouldn't actually just think of the local context thing as a label that you stick on. Like Rose, it's very much what's that communication, what's that that understanding that's built around um, them that the label just represents. Um, so the other kind of thing that is really important in terms of a library community to understand around these labels is the visibility of the um, of these notices and the expectation of visibility, and so one of the other thing we did while working with these and with this um, these use cases was work on how we would display them on our own website, and you can see here that it's actually very prominent, and it's up at the top level and given equal importance in terms of the page where they sit, and so anyone coming on this page actually sees those labels as the first thing that's in that that's there. Um, these are just examples, which I won't um, worry about. The, the, so I'm just going to, uh, can I do that? Sorry. Um, so just to kind of finish up, I think it's for us, we've applied these We've applied notices across the collections and they are staying there. We've got the labels where we've worked with those four iwi in particular around adding the labels and they went through the process of, of crafting the, the wording around those labels. I think the big challenge is how you go forward and sustain that effort. Um, what next, once you've actually got that, how to, what should we be doing in terms of, um, you know, the next steps around that collaboration and, and, and that partnership? Um, and I think that's where, where the interesting thing is going forward. Um, the, other, the other challenge um, that I see is that the open, open data, open science, there's things like a, there's a global infrastructure for sharing this type of information. But how do we actually bring these notices and these labels forward and into that infrastructure so that there's an awareness through that wider community? And that's a piece of work I'm wanting to do and, and, and just starting on now is how do we actually get that information to flow properly into some of those other, into those other frameworks. So I think I'll leave it there. Namahi, Aaron, thanks very much for that. And we'll hand over to uh, Tapu Tu. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll do a slideshow now. <laughs> Goodbye. <Can't play. laughs> okay, hopefully this works because I didn't actually practice. <laughs> Can people see my slideshow? Uh, yeah, but it's in kind of, uh, got it. Okay. Uh, kia rana tātou kāta tō ko tapusi kura tō ko wenga, nō pāmati e ma o ki mai au, uh, e nō ana au ki Raumati Beach, ki Wellington, e 
Aoki Aotearoa. Um, so kia ora everyone, my name is Tabatu and I'm the Program Manager for the Digital Pacific website. But today I'm going to be sharing my experience with the traditional knowledge labels um, from the community work that I've done here in Wellington. Um, so this beautiful picture is of me and my class members of the uh, Cook Islands language class here in Puriro. Um, so a bit of background about the Cook Islands. Uh, there's 15 islands and 10 languages, uh, 10 distinct uh, languages. Uh, most of these languages are very endangered um, and the most common language uh, spoken by the Cook Islanders is the Rarotongan language. But many of us in this class aren't only just from Rarotonga, but we're from the other islands in the Cook Islands. So we wanted to learn about the other dialects or the other languages from the islands that we are from. Um, so we did this. Uh, many of our elders hold these languages and many of the resources aren't available for many of us Cook Islanders that are living abroad. So we decided that we we're going to get some funding and um, try and capture the languages of our elders before they pass. So we got some funding um, to do 10, um, 10 films to capture these languages from our elders and to also capture what makes these islands unique to them. So like I said, these languages are really critically endangered. And so our teacher here in the middle, um, her, uh, her passion is the language and she wanted us to be able to learn the languages where we're from. So we had to go and meet with all of these islands um, in Puriroa. Um, so we had to uh, attend each of the island committee meetings. Um, which was really scary because many of our elders, they're not really willing to share their knowledge and some of us, some of them made us cry, but that's okay. Um, some of the other tribulations that we had to go through was scheduling and timing. Um, we had a short time frame to get these films done and like Island Time, some of these uh, meetings get delayed. Another thing that we had to deal with was COVID. Uh, many of the elders that we wanted to film um, didn't want to come out into public because of risk of contracting COVID. Um, and some of the other things was around fear of sharing knowledge. And in the past, they've been taken advantage of from previous projects. And so they, they weren't willing to share. Um, and also when we met with each of the island groups, copyright and ownership always came up they were always asking the question who was going to be owning the copyright of these films and the ownership of it and how could we ensure that nobody would be making money off their knowledge and um, how we could ensure that their rights uh, were, um, were acknowledged and they were acknowledged for the knowledge that they shared. Um, also this was a voluntary project so Many of us are working full time, so it was really hard to schedule in uh, times to do this um, big film project when we're all very busy. Um, so like I said, many of the meetings that we did go and meet with the community, um, they were asking about the intellectual property, who would own this, um, how would these films be used in the future? So for example, if a film producer wanted to use these, how could we ensure that they uh, they were asking the community for permission to do so? And who would profit from these films as well? Making sure that no one would make money of these films because it was a way to educate and a resource for the language as well. And what would happen if a film director would wanted to use it as well? So when they're throwing all these questions at me, I knew that local context could possibly be an answer to these questions. And so we contacted our friends at local context. Um, we also had our film crew involved in this as well. They're really interested in applying these traditional knowledge labels to the films to educate other film producers of how they could interact with uh, Indigenous communities and ensure that they're doing this in the correct way. 
Um, so we had a meeting with local context and they're really um they really liked the idea that we wanted to add these to a film because they hadn't been used like this before. So they were really supportive of the project. And so um, with these 10 films, we interviewed and made, uh, interviewed the elders. Um, and after the filming, they got to choose what labels that they would like to be added to the film. And this is how they were displayed on the film as well. So over here we have the labels that they did choose and they showed up three times during the film but we also really wanted to educate the community and others about what these actually mean. So at the end of the credits um, we had a bit more information of what these labels actually mean. And I think um, this is the first time that they were actually asked about how like how the process of this as well. So making sure that they were involved in it and they had the authority to put these labels on was really important. Um, like many of the people that were filmed, they're elderly. So some of the challenges that I faced was they actually don't know how to use a website. So what we did, or I had to do is um, make my own kind of PDF form of all the labels where they could select. Um, they needed that kind of paper um, paper, old school paper where they could circle which ones that they wanted to um, apply to the film um, and this is a way that they could actually acknowledge, we could actually acknowledge the people that were in the film, we made sure that all of their names were spelled correctly because I think many of our libraries and things like that they don't actually acknowledge the people that were in the film um, they also got to uh, share what labels that they would like to add. So a lot of them picked the uh, attribution and verified, non-commercial and um, open to collaborate. So they're always open to collaborate with other research institutions about their culture and their knowledge. Um, and then, um, so this is what the films look like in the end. So Ten of the islands, allowing them to share their knowledge in a way that they were proud of um, and also um, sharing what makes them unique. So these have been really important resources for not only our Cook Island class to actually learn the language and the different uh, culture of each of these islands, but it's a resource for other Cook Islanders around the world that they can access because these are the probably there's not many uh, language resources in particular on these uh, islands as well. So that was really fast and hopefully everyone got the gist of it. Um, but yeah, that was Thank my <laughs> quick Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. It's And it's great to see the labels applied in different contexts in different ways. And so um, with the three of you, it's kind of like, We've got three distinct examples of how the, these labels are being used, which is really fantastic. So I do have some questions for the um, for the three of you. And the first question is around how do Indigenous communities share their knowledge in a way that aligns with their community rules and protocols? And I guess a follow-on from that is, was there any awareness of the traditional or the knowledge labels when you went out to talk to community. So I can see Tapitu going, no, 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 but we might start with you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I kind of had to pull that out of my back pocket when they kept asking me about uh, copyright and who's going to be owning it um, because they were firing questions at me. And so they were unaware of these traditional knowledge labels and they were happy to know that there was an actual way that they could actually put something in place for their own um, their own knowledge, but also their own resources as well. So they were happy that they would be able to um, kind of hold the narrative of what they were going to be sharing about. So I think what I've learned is that we need to be uh, with the community, we need to go through them with the process as well. So 
um, I learned quite a lot from those face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. So there was a lot of things that they didn't want to share, which were really okay with it. So some of the traditional practices like the pe'e, um, there was a lot of pushback on why they didn't want to share it. So I think it's about learning with them as well um, and, sh and just acknowledging that they have rights to their, their cultural knowledge as well. And was that your experience too, Aaron, when you were on your projects? Yeah, uh, it was kind of a double whammy, I think, for some of the communities. Firstly, there was, hey, we've got all this stuff that's that's come from the Fenua and the Orohi, um, and it's been collected. You know, it's to some of it's you know back since 1769. Um, so there's this legacy and the thing and the, and of collecting that we need to acknowledge, and for them. So for those communities, understanding the, the the provenance and how that stuff had come about um, was 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 the first piece. But then they were also kind of going engaging around what these labels meant. And we were very lucky that um, it was we were working collaboratively with um, Maui and his team, you know, at the time. And so that whole he they were very strong on that process around the labels um, because of, you know you were doing both these things, um, which could be you know quite daunting in terms of what does it all mean and we didn't even know the stuff existed to begin with so yeah um rose a question for you how do you particularly in the open space how do you balance that desire for openness with the need to respect indigenous knowledge that's yeah, I mean, for me, it always comes back to the community, right? The community needs to be the decision maker in that process and they need to decide what is the appropriate amount, amount of openness. Um, and I think that's why these tools, or particularly the local context tools, are so fantastic because they can open up collections, connect them, be connected to the correct people, um, and then there can be protocols and permissions in place that... Um, put rules around the access. So I think that's it's a great step forward, I would say. Um, in, in the communities, in your context, so National Library, research centres, um, Manaki Whenua, what is the awareness amongst your colleagues and other researchers and academics about the existence of local contexts and the traditional knowledge labels. Um, I, mean, I, I guess I'm. Oh, sorry. You go. Uh, can, just to, just to step back, I think one of the other things that the, the this type of framework does I, I, that I perceive was really important, and that was that these like these notices and labels transitioned a, a collection holding organisation from being the gatekeeper. To actually being a facilitator um, and so we don't have to get in the way of those conversations we're basically providing that signpost you know someone comes and sees data we hold and I think that's an important change um, that that relates back to your previous question and and you know it's I think an important part of empowering uh, that community um, we don't yeah we don't I, I think it's really great to get the collections and the, the academic institutes out of the middle of that conversation in terms of we just, you know, hopefully can see it happen. In terms of the awareness, I think that within Manaki Whenua, it's quite high because we've been quite proactive around this work um, and there's been a high um, prevalence of it. Um, if I look at it globally, I think we're the first collection-based institute around the world to actually apply these things um, and to start trying it. There's certainly an awareness in some of the Scandinavian, um, North American countries um, and Australia but it's um, within the community I reach, it's just kind of coming on the cusp of the conversations now. So it's mm -hmm. yeah. um, just in terms of the whole CRI, um, CRIs within New Zealand, there is a pan CRI working group around, it's called Maori data governance in terms of how the, the, the CRIs will respond to that. Um, but I always say, well, it's actually not just Maori, it's actually all indigenous communities. Um, so the, the so the awareness is growing within um, within those communities. Um, Rose, did you have something to add? 
I was just going to say, I find in Australia there's a lot of uh, both institutions and communities that have heard about local context labels and notices, but they don't really understand. Um, so there's a very low adoption rate currently in Australia, but I think, um, yeah, I think that's going to change very, very quickly and we're just going to, it's going to take one major institution with a strong community part, partnership like Menaki Fanua has already demonstrated in Aotearoa. We just need one something like that in Australia to lead the way and I think others will be quickly following suit. So that's a, a whittle or a challenge to anybody in those decision-making um, authority that are here on this call. Maybe you're that institution that wants to lead the way in Australia. So uh, Tapu, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, at the National Library, there has been some conversations about uh, implementing the knowledge labels, but just not knowing how to do it. I don't know if our systems are ready for it um, to ingest it. Um, I don't think we have the enough community engagement to actually apply these labels. So I think my project was going to be like the first one to actually kind of test it in a dummy run of how we could actually implement these traditional knowledge labels into the library's uh, collections. Um, we've had a few presentations from Whakatohi as well at the National Library and also the work that they've been doing with uh, Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision. So colleagues are aware of it, but I think we just need to learn from Aaron of how you actually implemented it um, and kind of follow what you're, going, you're doing since you've already done it. Um, I know for Digital Pacific, we've found it, that's kind of one of the things that we want to um, implement as well in the next year, is to show how we could actually put these, uh, make these labels um, identifiable in our website. Um, so that's what we're going to be paying for some money next year, um, but we need more communities and more um, institutions to be using these labels to actually implement it and more data as well around it. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we might go to some of the questions that we've had from uh, the audience. Thank you very much for those. Um, there's a question for uh, Rose and Aaron. Do you have any insights into how scholarly publishers um, are currently conveying First Nations authors, affiliations, countries and language groups? Um, what are you seeing in kind of the traditional Place, or is it evolving? Is it changing? I might start with you, Rose. Oh no, Aaron's Aaron's already unmuted. <laughs> well, I was very happy for Rose to go first. <laughs> um, so what we see, and particularly when we were looking into uh, current practice with the um, Indigenous Knowledges Referencing Guide, is that there's no consistency at the moment and often it's up to individual researchers and authors um, to self-identify. Um, but there's, the, there's certainly uh, a growing trend, if you will, to, I think, why well, see, and I do it in my practice as well, when I'm referencing another Indigenous scholar's work, I will reference them and their cultural affiliation if they have said it as well, and that's what we've recommended in the guide. Um, and then we put, I put that into practice with uh, a journal article that I published with a, a, another Aboriginal woman, uh, Leanne Wilson, where she shared some of her cultural knowledge in the journal. And, um, and to do that, and we put a traditional knowledge uh, notice on that, um, to do that, we had to work with the journal editor to, to get that all through the style guide, through the publishing guidelines, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's, again, it's an area where academic uh, pub journal publication is moving towards. You're muted, Kim. Oh, no, I nearly got through the whole thing without doing that. <laughs> 10 minutes to go. <laughs> um, Rose, with the referencing guide, do you have any sense of what the take up of it has been, or um, have you had any feedback from the Caval community about the use not, of the guide? Not from Caval so far. So it was launched in March this year officially. It took a while to filter down through the partner universities, 
Um, and because it's, you know, we we handed it over to them and they've they've sort of worked with it. Um, we have definitely have had a lot of positive feedback. Um, and I should say we did do community consultation as well from Victorian traditional owner groups and said that had knowledge in some of those universities held and that how would you feel about this if you were referenced in this way. So that was all positive, yeah, so far. Yes. But I, I should stipulate it's version one or the first edition and it will be a living document that gets updated and evolves as, as our understanding of how best practice should work evolves. And you would hope that the other styles that are in use would come up with a way of in their style guides and in the citation software and things that a lot of people use to do this in a simple um, in a straightforward way for researchers and students as well. For sure. And that's where like um, a lot of open access journal journals that are self-publishing have a lot of autonomy to decide mm -hmm. on their style. So that that was the journal I worked with was one of those. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the big publishing houses are a lot more rigid about that stuff. Fantastic. And then we've just got one last question that I'll throw to the panel. Um, and it's the same one that I finished with at the first panel. Uh, what can this community do um, to support uh, local contexts and the traditional knowledge labels? And we'll start with uh, Taputu. I'm just encouraging institutions and communities to use it. Um, like when I, oh, for my job, I have to travel quite a lot to the Pacific. Um, and they're still in their journey about digitization and working on their metadata. So because they belong to those communities, I've been encouraging them to apply these traditional knowledge labels. So bigger institutions like National Library or institutions around the world, when they harvest it, they've got those permissions and those labels on there already. Mm -hmm. So if they're starting off doing this work, might as well start adding these labels to it now. Um, so they don't have to go back and do it again. So that's just encouraging and educating people and institutions about these labels and the importance of them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rose or Aaron? Aaron? <laughs> okay. Um, look, I think, and I, th I completely agree with what um, uh, Tapotu has just said. I think that, that, that being brave, using them, um, and actually get a, uh, encouraging that practice within our community is, is really powerful and, 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 and we need to start somewhere. Um, I, I don't think we've seen the end of this journey. I think we're just at the start of it in terms of the tools that will emerge. Um, so one of the other things I think we can do is look, and because a lot of our, our work is standards-based, um, in exchange of information between libraries, between academic institutes, it's how can we encourage the space for this type of information to travel with that, that data? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the next kind of big challenge that we actually face is, is, is that kind of digital, promoting that kind of digital um, footprint, I, I guess is the best way to put it. And finally to you, Rose. Um, I would say if you're an Indigenous researcher and you're comfortable doing so, include your cultural affili affiliation in anything you publish. If you're a librarian, school librarian, liaison librarian, you go and find the Cabal Guide. Um, and if you're a collecting institution, sign up for an account on the Local Context Hub and put an open to collaborate notice on your website and then tell your your Aboriginal, oh, sorry, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but your Indigenous community members, that the labels are there. And that is a fantastic place to leave, leave the panel for today. I want to thank you all very much for your generosity and for your time. And I know there are a lot of people going, right, what do we need to do? So what are we going to do on Monday about this? So that's the challenge to all of you on Monday. We don't have to wait till Monday. Um, before you go home today, what are you going to do about traditional knowledge labels and supporting um, the dissemination of Indigenous knowledges in a respectful way? So thank you very much. Homaiti Paki Paki. Join me in thanking all our panellists. It was wonderful to have you here.
Um, I want to say a huge thanks to uh, Marissa and Lyndall. It'd be really nice if you turn your cameras on <laughs> and if we could see Marissa, <laughs> uh, Kesson and Lyndall Holston, um, who organized this panel and have been the ducks in the background with their feet uh, making sure that it all goes really, really well. I'd like to thank uh, Janet and Ginny at the Open Access uh, Office. A huge thank you to the Open Access uh, uh, 2023 uh, OAA Week, um, OA Week uh, Organising Committee, uh, Richard White, who uh, chaired the committee again for the second year running, uh, Lyndall Holstein from Massey University, uh, Garth Smith from Waikato, um, Marissa Kesson from Waikato, uh, Donna Coventry from AUT, uh, Zachary Kendall from the University of Melbourne, uh, Janet Catterall uh, from James Cook University and Open Access Australasia, Arthur Smith from Call. Sandra Fry um, from Open Access Australasia, and of course, uh, Ginny Barber. Um, I just want to leave you with a, a koha, a gift. Um, Call has an upcoming event on the 14th of November. Um, it's about First Nations uh, collection description guidelines for the library sector. Um, if you are interested, or you know a colleague that is interested, uh, Marissa has just shared uh, the link in the chat. I'd like to thank you, um, all the participants that have stayed around on a Friday afternoon uh, and joined us for this fabulous session. Um, happy Open Access Week. Thank you for sharing this afternoon with us. Uh, kia kaha, kia maia, kia manawanui. Be strong, be brave, be steadfast. Kia ora. Thank you.